My father-in-law, John Schneider, is a charter member of the fire department dating back to 1948. What you learn from them is the fact that they wanted to do something for the community, and thank God they did, because uh, Evergreen Fire Department has grown into one of the best of the best. When I joined Evergreen's Fire Department, the training was so much more intense and so much better than what I had experienced on a smaller fire department. Had I not joined, there's a whole lot of people in Evergreen that I would not know their name. You know, it's a family type thing. I spent a lot of time with my dad over the years because I was helping him. Uh, I'd go out with him um, in the summertime sometimes, and we'd go on fire calls, and I'd go with him. You know, they got me to the point where probably when I was old enough, I was carrying, you know, water tanks and, and hose packs. My dad joined the fire department in 1950, so I grew up as a little kid around the fire trucks, the stations, the brass pole, the whole nine yards, and I joined the fire department. One night at about 20 below zero, we had been on a fire for hours. We were frozen. We had ice all over us, and one of the guys turned around and looked at me and said, where else can you have this kind of fun for free? When I joined this department, I didn't know what I was going to be getting into. And when I did that, I found a new family. It was, it was like a family. It was special. Uh, at the time, <clears throat> I was on a path to self-destruction, and I ran into Paul Conscious in a parking lot, and he said, we need firemen. You want to join? So I did. Did it change your life? Indeed. <clears throat> it, it gave me some purpose and changed me uh, considerably. My husband became a fireman in February of 65, and I arrived in Evergreen, was hired as a folk singer at Greystone Guest Ranch, which my husband's family ran. And the first time that Bill and I were ever alone together, he said, I need to stop at the firehouse. Do you mind? And I said, no, of course not. He, I said, why? And he said, well, I'm a new fireman, and one of my jobs is to take the hose out of the hose dryer. And I said, wow, well, I've never seen a hose dryer. And he said, well, come in, let me show you. My father-in-law was on the volunteer fire department since it started. Mel Crossan, they call him Swede. And uh, one evening, Monday evening, he knocked at the door and he said, let's go for a ride. And uh, we stopped at station one. He, he told me when we got down there, he said, well, if you're gonna live up here, you might as well be a volunteer fireman. That's where it started. That was in 1968. So he started to show me the hose dryer and, and I'm standing by this fire truck, this great big fire truck. And I said, wow, I've never been this close to a fire truck. And he said, um, you want to sit in the seat? And he opened the door and I climbed up and I said, of course, yes. And he turned on the lights and siren and oh my gosh, I felt like the queen. And I'm sitting there and he said, you can sit there, but don't touch anything except the steering wheel. So I did, and I looked out one of the little windows, and I saw the Roundup, which was, is now the Little Bear. And I looked at that and thought, huh, that's a bar. Wonder if the firemen, and just then Bill came back, and I said, do the firemen ever hang out in that bar? And he laughed, and he said, oh yes, they definitely do. After four o'clock, you can probably find half the force in there. And I said, well, if the siren goes, they can't drive a fire truck, can they? And he said, we figure if they can get down those rickety steps and across the street without getting hit by a car, then they're sober enough to drive a fire truck. The REO Speedwagon. 
Uh, the Diamond Rio that we have, it's actually an American service apparatus company that built it. It was a challenge to drive. It had four-speed transmission at two-speed rear end, and the brakes weren't very good on it. They're still not very good on it. And, but we had to drive it to its edge, you know, as fast as we could, and we had to be real careful about driving it. Coming down the hills, if you missed a shift on it and you could not get in the shift, you're not going to be able to stop it with the brakes. It was a difficult truck to drive, but fun. It caused a lot of anxieties when you drove it because everybody was passing you. If another fire truck or even one of the firemen with a pickup or something would come up and just kind of tap it in the back and use that horsepower to get it up the hills. I don't think anybody ever uh, turned in any damages for pushing and, and uh, in fact it was quite thrilling when you had somebody come up and you'd feel that bump and, and uh, you'd put it into a higher gear and you'd go a few more miles faster. That's a pipe pull and it's to pull ceilings down. This is the 51 Rio. It was the first fire engine in the whole area, in the mountain area, Lakewood, Golden, so it was pretty sought after. Because fire departments built their own little fire trucks back then in the 40s and 50s. And out of pickups and stuff, and this was ordered from back east. It's a 500 gallon per minute pumper. It was good for one or two lines, but it was only good for five minutes or 10 minutes. The Mac was incredible. Back when it had the five-speed transmission in it, when it was we had a clutch in it, it was a lot faster. Uh, plus, it had bias ply tires on it, which now it has radials, so it kind of floats. When it had bias ply tires, it was like a Porsche on the corner. My cousin Jimmy, he'd drive that thing from Evergreen to Kittredge, and he would only slow down on one curve. He hit every curve on that truck at 62 miles an hour, except for one. I mean, it just was so fast. It took a lot of skill to drive it, and it kind of frightened a lot of people. That's why they took the five speed out of it. But if you could really learn how to use that, how to drive it, that truck was fun to drive. We still have it. There was a time when I thought, what a good experience it would be to bring a truck up there and have them go through the truck, set off the siren, the lights. The chief said, fine, that's, that's a great idea. So I did that, and it was a it was a real fun experience. Burning down houses? Oh yeah, that was a lot of fun. It was a good time. There was a lot of buildings that people wanted to get rid of, and we were certainly willing to get rid of them for them. Somebody would donate an outbuilding, even a house, and you'd learn how to make forcible entry, knock down doors, go through windows to get to the seat of the fire. We'd get two or three a year, usually. You'd burn them and burn them, because it was great training. One thing that was nice, because we we're a nonprofit, they could deduct it from their, their taxes. My grandmother, when she passed away, she put in her will that would give the house to the fire department. And so I was there when they burned that house down. We were kind of reckless a little bit about it sometimes. Some of them were a little too hot. The flames were rolling up the back of our heads. Then we knock them down, you know. We did a training. One of our biggest exercises was a mass casualty incident. We had a helicopter come in on that for that training. Uh, we did a lot of triaging on that training. We had a multiple of like 30 patients. Car fires. They went to car fires all the time. Every Monday night they went to training. And I think it was Monday night when the auxiliary also met. We tried to keep supplies like ham and cheese and bread and mustard and mayonnaise and, you know, to make sandwiches. I did the Mount Evans. I got stuck carrying a water pack. We had to hike in uphill at 12,000 feet and it was just horrible. <laughs> Bill went to two different fires on Mount Evans, and I would stand and look over at Mount Evans and, and see the fires going on and think, well, my husband is up there helping fight that. <laughs> it was totally exhausting. Our pagers went off, and I jumped in the car. I knew we were going to Main Street. I knew it was either the hotel or the Little Bear. My wife and I were coming home, and we just drove by the front of the Little Bear, and both of us commented, said, you smell smoke? 
pager goes off. I open my eyes. There's flames in my windows. I live right above downtown, and I could see the glow. Oh, I could see it from my house. As soon as I got the call, I was... I looked out the window and I saw it. I, I couldn't believe it. I radioed to dispatch that it's actually the hotel. I gave a quick size up of what I saw. I ran down to the little bear and in so many words I said, everybody get out now. Myself and two of the other doormen started grabbing people and giving them out the door as quickly as we could. The lights were flickering and the, it was things were starting to pop and the band was trying to get away from the wall and we were just everybody was trying to get out. It was crazy. I came around the corner at the dam where you first get that view and there were flames a hundred feet over the top of the Little Bear. Everybody knew this was the big one. I thought sure we were going to lose Evergreen. <laughs> because that 1926 fire was in the back of our mind, you know, it burned down once, we're not going to let it burn down twice. And they lost quite a few buildings. And when I was standing there before any engine arrived, I was there by myself, standing on Main Street, looking at the hotel. And I, I was a little nervous. Flames were pretty much heat, throwing a lot of heat. We were prepared for that fire. We knew that, that the first truck had to go past the fire because if he would have laid his line from that, the hydrant there at, uh, in front of Baskin Robbins, it would have closed the road. And so John Bacchus knew that. And so he went past and, and, and did that perfectly, and that set up everything that happened after that. And John describes this. They all came out with their drinks, and they're all standing in the parking lot across the way. He was driving by it, and they're all standing there shouting at him, there's the fire, there's the fire. Like, he's going, like, I don't know that. As soon as we hit the little bear with water, I heard this roar, the patrons, and we just kept hearing cheers, save the bear, save the bear. There wasn't any interior attack, so everybody was outside. Everybody knows it's kind of a fire trap down there. They're all built right next to each other. There's no spaces. And it was a weird scene because it was very, it was very smoky. You couldn't see anything. And the power lines were still active. And they were dropping sparks. And then as we're going up, we're, we're seeing this glow behind us. We're going, what's that? We finally get through the smoke a little bit, and there's a house on fire behind us. I was on a hose line on the roof of the Little Bear. It was, it was an intense fire. We kind of felt like the age of the buildings and everything that was going on. I said after the fire, we had angels on our shoulder. I walked down and met Kenny and we were standing down there and Ross Grimes was standing down there. And so he was trying to tell us how to fight this fire. And Kenny was trying to explain to him, you know, we know how to fight this fire. And, and it, you know, he wasn't listening. And finally, you know, the, the truck pulls up. And Kenny finally had enough of him and yelled at him and said, Ross, we know how to fight this fire. Either you help us or get out of the way. <laughs> and he did. He helped us pull the hose up there. And so then we started shooting the water down in there. And then, you know, the flames started slowly going down. And then once they got to the point where it was safe enough, from the bottom they were able to go in and use hose lines. Oh, yeah. Trees behind oh, the trees, the trees, power the lines were popping. Behind were caught on fire. There's a house back there completely destroyed. And it started working its way into the bear. A little in shock, we really are, because it's uh, so significant to downtown, and it's the, one of the last three buildings in the core of downtown that are the history of Evergreen. It's amazing that the fire department got that out. It could have burned down the whole town. So we were very lucky that we were able to contain the fire to that building. This one, I think we had it because we had the pre-plans. Pre this is, pays off to have pre-plans. And having that firefighter at Station 1 that could roll that engine, that, that was the key. That was a key. If it would have taken any longer to roll that engine out of Station 1, we might have been looking at a different scenario. But it was a good save. We knocked it down in, man, no time. But one of the greatest stops probably most anywhere because that's heavy timber in that hotel. Heavy timber in the Little Bear, an A-frame next door, stuff up the hill behind it. And we had just the right combination of people, equipment, hose lines, everything deployed in the right places and lost the hotel, but it was lost when we pulled up. Saved the little bear, saved everything else. It was one of those things where you're kind of high-fiving each other when it's over, even though it's, you know, it's not a basketball game. It still is one of those things that, you know, you're pretty into. It was fun. As a volunteer, 
you're there with people at their worst time and, and you make a big difference for them. And fighting a fire and getting it done is the biggest adrenaline rush you're ever going to have in your life. I mean, it is one of the most dangerous, craziest things you're going to do and under the most incredibly difficult and life-threatening conditions, and you'll survive it. The volunteers are what makes this engine go. And if we don't go, nobody else is going. So your neighbors, your town, depend on you. It becomes a brotherhood of the very highest esteem. Being a volunteer is a part-time job, but it's a big part of your life. It, it's from the heart, it's the giving. I believe everybody should volunteer for everything <laughs> as much as they can. Don't do it for the t-shirt and the hat. That's not what it's all about. It's not about the pay. It's, it's about doing something that you could do for the community. Okay, right here. I would encourage people to get involved because the things that we teach you how to do, from medical to fire science to wildland to self-contained breathing apparatus, all the things that you do are just, that's what regular people don't get to do. And your neighbors know that you learn things. So when something goes wrong in the neighborhood, somebody's gonna run and get you to come solve the problem because they know you're a firefighter. I look back at Evergreen that I marvel at. It's always been innovation. If you look at, you know, all the equipment is top notch, it's first line. If you just you know, look at where they are now, I mean, going from a little fire station, or even prior to that, nothing, um, in 1948 to today, it's an amazing transition. And I have, looked at a lot of fire departments over the, over around the country. I've looked at a lot of volunteer fire departments and I've never found one that was as good as this fire department. 